Hello biology students and welcome to video two of the ecology unit. So in this video we're going to be looking at a few things um, and the first thing we're going to be discussing is first how do populations grow and we're also going to be looking at how different populations interact with one another. So let's start with population growth. So there are several different factors that affect the size of a population and they are birth rate, death rate, immigration, and emigration. So the birth rate is obviously the rate at which individuals are being born in a population. The death rate is the rate at which individuals are dying in a population. Emig immigration with an I is when individuals move into a population. And emigration with an E is when individuals leave, exit, or move away from a population. So you can kind of see that birth rate and emigration are two things that cause a population to grow. And death rate and emigration are two things that cause a population to shrink. So if birth rate plus immigration if those two things, those two rates, are equal to death rate plus emigration, then the population will stay the same size. If birth rate and immigration are greater than death rate and emigration, then a population is growing. And if death rate and emigration are bigger than birth rate and immigration, then a population is shrinking. So another interesting thing to look at um, in terms of population growth are these things called survivorship curves. And what a survivorship curve basically is, it's a graph that's showing you how many individuals of a certain age are alive in a certain population. Um, so we have three main types of survivorship curves. So the first type is called type one. And in this survivorship curve, you can see um, between the newborn age and reproductive age, um, individuals don't really die, right? You can see that this slope is very low, which means for the most part, individuals survive until reproductive age. But then when they get older, they have a much higher chance of dying. Um, and this is accomplished because individuals like humans, we take really good care of our young, um, and we also have very few offspring, and we invest a lot of energy into helping those offspring survive. So we have fewer offspring are being produced, but there's more energy invested per offspring, so individuals generally live until a post-reproductive age. Most mammals are follow type 1 survivorship curves. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have type 3, and type 3 survivorship curves are shown by things like fish and insects and amphibians. I mean, you can see that these type of organisms have a really high chance of dying young, but then once they reach a certain age, they're pretty likely to survive. Um, and this happens because these type of organisms tend to produce really, really large numbers of offspring, um, but the parents don't invest a lot of energy into taking care of those offspring so many of them die. So you can kind of think like fish, fish lay thousands of eggs, but the parents don't really like take care of those eggs. Um, so many of those offspring die before they can actually reach reproductive age. So there's a lot of offspring are born, but not a lot of energy per offspring is invested to keep them alive. And then in the middle, it's a type two curve. And this is basically a steady decline of survivorship. So it kind of falls somewhere in between type one and type two. Um, there's a medium amount of kids are born and um, some energy is invested in, in keeping them alive, but not as much. Okay, um, so let's look at something else in, in, that's related to how populations grow. So it turns out there are two different ways that populations can grow. Um, the first is called exponential growth, and this basically means the rate of growth will increase indefinitely. Um, so basically at every generation, you're more or less doubling your population size. Um, and you can see, because the curve is getting steeper and steeper, that means my rate of growth is getting higher and higher. So we have, um, um, we end up with a lot of organisms in a short period of time. And you can kind of imagine that this can only happen under ideal conditions. So this can only happen if there's unlimited resources to support this exponential growth, there's no predators, um, et cetera. So ideal environmental conditions. And you can kind of imagine ideal conditions don't exist very often, so this can really only happen for very short periods of time. Um, we can contrast this now with something called logistic growth. And if we look at the graph here, Logistic growth actually is exponential at the beginning. So you can see this part that I've outlined in black, that is exponential growth. But at some point, the environment can no longer um, support this really rapid growth. There aren't enough resources for all these individuals. Predators are working to keep the population in check. And at some point, the population growth will level out. Um, and the, the place where it levels out is called the carrying capacity. Um, so th the carrying capacity is equal to the number of organisms that a given environment can support. 
this type of growth is much more common than exponential growth um, because you know resources aren't unlimited you know there, there will be things limiting the growth of a population um, so carrying capacity like, like I said before is, is defined as the maximum number of individuals of a species that an ecosystem can support and it's determined by these things called limiting factors now there are two types of limiting factors we have things called density dependent limiting factors and a density dependent limiting factor are limiting factors that that um, play a larger role when the population density is high so things like competition is density dependent right competition plays a bigger role in limiting population size when you have a high density things like disease are density dependent because again when you have a high density of individuals disease can be spread more easily from one individual to the next predation or you know being eaten by predators this, this is a density dependent limiting factor because you are more likely to be eaten by a predator if you have a large population um, the other type of limiting factor are called density independent limiting factors um, and these are factors that limit a population size or influence carrying capacity but they are not dependent on density so things like natural disasters right a natural disaster is going to affect a low density population and it's also going to affect a high density population things like unusual weather that's a again it's something that contributes to carrying capacity but it's not dependent on the density of the population so then um, finally our last little top topic with populations here is ways that populations can interact so populations can interact in one of three ways that we're going to look at. Um, one is that they might have a predator-prey relationship. One population might be trying to eat the other one. They might um, have a. They might be competing, or they, they might be under competition, and that means that two populations are trying to vie for the same resources. Or they might have what's called a symbiotic relationship, which is a very close relationship where at least one member of the relationship benefits. And there are three types of symbiotic relationships. There are mutualisms, commensalisms, and parasitisms, which we will look at in a few minutes. Um, so let's look at a mutualism first. So we had talked about how symbiotic relationships are a relationship where at least one organism is benefiting. Now, in a mutualism, both organisms are actually benefiting. So we can call it a positive-positive relationship. Um, so an example I'm going to give you is the clownfish, like Nemo from Finding Nemo and, and, and Anemone, which is the like plant-like coral structure it lives in. It's not really a plant, it's coral. Um, and in this relationship, both organisms are benefiting. So the clownfish is um, getting protection from the anemone because the anemone can sting other organisms, um, whereas the anemone is benefiting because the clownfish um, kind of eats any little algae um, that are growing on the anemone, so the, the clownfish help to keep it clean. So that's an example of a mutualism. The next type of symbiotic relationship is called the commensalism, and this is where one organism is benefiting, and the other one is not either hurt or, nor helped, so it's kind of neutral. So we can call, call this a positive-neutral relationship. So our example here are cattle and cattle egrets. So when cattle walk through the tall grasses, they stir up lots of bugs, um, and these cattle egrets, these birds, can eat those bugs. So the cattle egret is benefiting from the relationship, but the cattle is neither hurt nor harmed. So this type of symbiosis is called a commensalism. Then finally, our last type of um, symbiotic relationship is called a parasitism. And this is where one benefits and the other is harmed. And we can call this a positive negative relationship. Um, now keep in mind that this is different from predator prey because in predator prey, one organism is eating the other. That's not happening in a parasitism. Um, so, so an example of, of a parasitism would be a tapeworm in a human. So um, sometimes humans get infected with tapeworms, which are these little organisms that live inside the reproductive tract of humans. Um, and as humans eat food, the tapeworms basically eat the, eat the food that the humans are eating um, and use that to grow, so it's benefiting them. But the humans are being hurt because the humans aren't actually able to digest and use the food for nutrients themselves. So here, the tapeworm is benefiting and the human is being harmed because they're losing nutrients. Um, another example is, would be like a tick and a moose. Um, you know, we know that ticks suck in the blood of animals, including moose, so the tick is getting nutrients, but the moose is being harmed. Again, this is not predator-prey because the tick isn't eating the moose, it's just sucking some of its blood. Okay. So to switch gears a little bit, um, we just talked about how pop populations and how populations interact with one another. Now we're going to totally switch gears and talk about these things called succession and also a little bit about invasive species. 
So first, let's talk about succession first. So succession is basically um, the order in which organisms will colonize an area. And there are two types of succession. We have what's called primary succession, and we have what's called secondary succession. So primary succession, the main defining characteristic here, is that we're dealing with land that has no soil and no um, living organisms on it. So this might be um, after a volcanic eruption with lava flow, new rock is created, so we have no soil. This might be if a new island forms from a volcano in the ocean and there's nothing living there, it's just rock, we will get primary succession. So you can kind of imagine the first thing that has to happen is we have to form a soil. So we have these species called pioneer species. There are things like lichen, things like mosses, and they can come in and they can actually live on these rocks here and break them down and form soil. Now, once soil is formed, now that leads the way for things like small grasses. If a bird dropped a grass seed onto this developing soil, now we can have small grasses growing. And the small grasses, you know, die, and they're broken down into nutrients by decomposers. And now, at some point, we'll have enough soil and nutrients to support small shrubs. And that process will repeat until we're able to, able to support small trees. Um, and you can kind of see we have smaller plants being replaced by bigger plants. Um, and if this process starts on bare rock with no soil, it's called primary succession. Okay, so, so to kind of summarize that, um, the, our first type of succession is primary su succession. It occurs in an uninhabited area that does not have soil, maybe after a lava flow or after a glacier recedes. And the first species that come in are our pioneer species, um, and they break up the rock, they create soil, and then from there we can get low-growing plants, medium-sized plants, tr fast-growing trees, and then slow-growing trees. Um, once, once we've reached the slow-growing tree stage, that's called the climax community, because that's the last stage that we're going to see in, in succession. Now we can contrast this with secondary succession. So secondary succession is very similar to primary. The only difference is that the soil already exists. So we might have a fire might come through and wipe out an entire area, but even though all the plants died, there's still soil here, which means we don't really need pioneer species. Or if we use pioneer species, they're, they're not really needed as much to break down the rock. Um, so the pioneer species um, section is either not there or much shorter, and we can kind of jump right into these grasses and then right into these small shrubs and then the trees from there. So in secondary succession, we have an established community is destroyed by something, a fire, deforestation, disease, climate change, but we already have soil. So it's, it, it, it takes much less time, it's much quicker to reestablish that climax community. So then finally, the last little mini topic here in this video um, is I want to talk about invasive species a little bit. And invasive species are species that are not native to an area, that, which means they aren't naturally found there, um, but they spread there for some reason. So maybe, you know, a human brought them in to decorate their garden, or maybe they came over on a boat that came from a different continent. Um, and they tend to spread, spread to the point where it's harmful to a native species, and this is often because they don't have any natural predators in this area, because they didn't evolve to exist in the area. And if they have no natural predators, they're going to be able to grow exponentially for some small amount of time um, and, and take over a region. So the problem with invasive species is that, the, is that they're able to grow exponentially because they don't have natural predators. Um, so an example is something called the kudzu vine. You might have seen this if you've been anywhere in the southeast United States. Um, it's native to Asia, but it was brought over to America as a plant to decorate people's houses. Um, but because the south isn't cold enough to kill it like, like it would die normally in Asia, it has spread continuously and has literally taken over whole sections of like south and north Carolina um, because it's, it, it, it's not cold enough to die. Um, so this is an example of an invasive species that's growing exponentially because there's no natural way to kill it in the southeast United States. Okay, so that is Ecology Video 2 and I'll see you in Video 3.